And welcome to the Lord Mayoral Civic Event for the International Day of People with Disability. Sorry we've started a little late. We we're just waiting for a few extra people to attend. There's been some um, slight difficulties attending because of the hot weather. So we wanted to give every op everyone every opportunity to get here. Before we begin the evening, I'd like to welcome um, Frank Wanganin to perform the Ghana Welcome to Country. Uncle Frank Wanganin is a Ghana elder born in Wallaroo in Narunga country. He's lived in Adelaide for most of his life and been involved in a number of committees that deal with reconciliation and Aboriginal heritage, native title, social justice and the revival of the Ghana language. He's known best to me, though, um, as a guide. Um, I was very lucky um, some time ago as a long-term resident of the city and as someone who walks along the Torrens literally every day of my life to be taken on a guided walk uh, by Frank through the city and along the river and saw bits of my city uh, with absolutely fresh eyes. It was an extraordinary experience. So if you ever get an opportunity, can I urge you to go on a Frank Wanganin uh, walk? Frank, would you please come up um, to the front and... No worries, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here to, uh, tonight um, amongst all you special people. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, like for the International Year of Disability, so um, uh, yeah, I'm just a bit nervous uh, talking, talking to you there. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, just sort of, uh, uh, you're welcome to uh, Tandanyanka, a place we call Adelaide, uh, and um, what I'll just do is uh, speak it in the language. Night Tumpendi Tuila Berkiana, Night Tumpendi Bamba Mbaya Rendi, Gana Yurtiana, Marichi Yanga Gana Miyana, No Wangani Mani No Budni Gana Yurtiana, or Tandanyanka Wadliana. Yeah, what I just said is I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, place where we're meeting is on Ghana country, and I just also want to acknowledge uh, ancestors and uh, just uh, uh, on behalf of the Ghana people, I just welcome you to Ghana country. So, Nati, thank you. Thank you, Uncle Frank. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Megan Hendra. I'm one of the city councillors here at Adelaide City Council. Um, I, I'm your MC for this evening. I am start um, by acknowledging some of our guests, uh, the Deputy Lord, actually the Acting Lord Mayor, um, Hassam Abiyad, the Honourable Kelly Vincent, MLC, welcome Kelly, uh, Councillor Jill, Whitt Jill Whittaker from the um, State Executive of the Local Government Association, welcome Jill, uh, Nick Bagarkas, Chair of the Adelaide Central Market, Michael Deegan, Chief Executive Officer of DIPTI and his wife Elizabeth, welcome, Kirstine McKay, Acting Government Architect, Sally Neville. Not sure whether Sally's here yet, but uh, hopefully Sally will be here soon from the Restaurant and Catering Association. Jamie Newell, President of SA Unions. Uh, Anne Gale, Commissioner for Equal Opportunity. And a special welcome to the Access and Inclusion Advisory Panel members. These are the people who advise Adelaide City Council on uh, access and inclusion issues and do a great service for, for their community and our community. So Sue, Sue Gilby, welcome Sue. Sue's, Sue's also been the person who's uh, written tonight's event. Mm -hmm. um, Martin Sawtell from Access to Arts. Sue Lyons from Disability SA. Tony Starkey, yeah, they all deserve it. Let's do it at the end, shall we? Tony Starkey from the Royal Society for the Blind. And I'd like to also acknowledge some of the members of the committee who aren't here um, because their, their contribution's been sensational. Jess Frick, Debbie Smith, BJ Price, Peter Scott from the Guide Dogs Association, Amar Deep Singh from SCOZA, and Shalar Daniels Mays. So, yes, can we give them a round of uh, applause? Um, it's my job now to, and my honour, to hand over to the Acting Lord Mayor, Hassam Abiyad, who's going to speak to you briefly on, the, uh, in, on behalf of the Lord Mayor. 
Thank you, Councillor Hender. Good evening, everyone. I also acknowledge that we are meeting on Ghana land today, and I'd also would like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Councillor Hender, Councillor Clarahan, and also Councillor Martin. Thank you for joining us. I'm not sure any other councillors are here today. But uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Adelaide Town Hall uh, to mark the International Day of People with Disability 2015 um, and conduct a panel member discussion. International Day of People with Disability is held on the 3rd of December each year. It is a United Nations sanctioned day that is celebrated internationally. The day aims to increase public awareness, understanding and acceptance of people with disability and celebrate their achievements and contributions to the broader society. Adelaide City Council is a proud supporter and has facilitated and supported a range of events in the city this year including our gathering tonight. Adelaide City Council endorsed the Access Inclusion Strategy in 2012 and built on a history of access action plans dating back to 1998. The strategy introduction signalled a broader focus linking to national changes, including the introduction of the National Disability Strategy and the National Disability Insurance Scheme. As part of this work, we also established the Access and Inclusion Advisory Panel, which includes the introduction of a case study model to focus attention on outcomes. Key achievements during the panel's term, including operational and capital improvements at the Aquatic Centre and collaboration with the Urban Design Framework Project to encourage inclusive design principles and accessible design elements in the urban environment. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the panel for its ongoing commitment and support to inclusion in our city. Over the last two days, Council has run another project at the City Library called the Human Library Project. Ten people have taken on the role as human books sharing their experience of disability with the public. This has been a great initiative to help raise community awareness of disability and to help break associated stigmas. I would like to thank our 10 human books who are here tonight, thank you, for generously sharing their time and stories with us. Finally, I would like to encourage everyone here to contribute for our final annual Access and Inclusion Consultation, which can be found on your Say Adelaide website. This year, we ask, if you were the Lord Mayor of Adelaide, what three things would you do to ensure that people with disability can participate equally in life of the city? Your feedback will help inform planning going forward, and in particular, the four Access and Inclusion case study projects for 2016-17. For more information, please visit the Your Say website. Thank you for coming, and I wish you all a very productive session today. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, um, we'll be handing over um, and beginning our hypothetical in a minute. Before that, there are just a couple of housekeeping things that it's my duty to talk to you about. One is that the room is fitted with a hearing loop. It uh, it's, um, relates to the first five tables and there's actually a black line around you. You'll be able to see anything inside the black line. Um, there's, it has, has a hearing loop attached. So if you've got any hearing difficulties, the front five tables are the tables to be on. The session's going to be on up here on the screen. Um, it's also being Osvan interpreted, as you can see. Um, the session is going to be streamed live on the council website. For those of you who haven't had the delightful experience, um, all our council meetings are now streamed live on the council website. Please, any time you want to log on and have a look at us doing our business, you're more than welcome. Um, and tonight's is no exception. And a recording of tonight is going to be available on the council website probably in a week or so. My next very welcome duty is to introduce our host, the host of the hypothetical this evening, Claire O'Connor, SC. Claire's a barrister at Anthony Mason Chambers and has been practising law for over 30 years and teaching advocacy for over 20 years. 
She's worked in New Zealand, where she was first admitted, in the UK and in South Australia, and she's conducted hundreds of trials and appeals and inquests and been counsel in three royal commissions. Her notable career have got, has got many highlights. I've got quite a long list, so I'm got, I've given you a summary here. She's worked at the Legal Services Commission. She's been a solicitor at the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement. She's appeared at the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, acted as junior counsel in the Trevoro case, so involved in a number of high-profile high cases, represented Cornelia Rao, who you might remember was detained inappropriately in immigration detention. Um, in the last 12 months, she's represented families and survivors in the Civ 122, sorry, 221, the uh, boat that uh, sank. And currently, she's acting on a case that relates to Manus Island, challenging uh, the, the detention of people on Manus Island. In addition to that legal work, uh, Claire's been a huge contributor to her profession. She's taught advocacy all over the country and in Bangladesh. Uh, she stirs the pot well and truly in relation to the recognition and involvement of women in law and has, done, and has made a considerable change to our profession as a consequence of that. Um, and she's going to be the host this evening of what I hope will be a highly entertaining uh, hypothetical. So Claire, please come on up. Thank you, Megan. I can see that your consultancy work really does make you <laughs> quite good at being able to describe people in very glowing ways. Thank you. I'm quite embarrassed sitting there. Um, thank you very much for coming on what is a, quite a warm Friday night. And thank you to the people that at home that are watching this live. I can't imagine who would be sitting at home watching this particular hypothetical. But what will be very good about it, of course, is it's being filmed. And we're hoping that other councils who are as equally concerned as the Adelaide Council to ensure access for people that are disabled will pick up and get information from this particular event. Um, it's my delight to introduce to you our panellists, and I'm not quite sure when they're going to come up to the table. Perhaps we'll do that first. We'll invite the panellists to come up to the table, and if someone could give Mike a hand, that would be great. There's, why is there N? Thank you. This way. Why is here? Okay, thank you. Skinny cheese Thank you. Thank you. And of course, those of you who um, aren't blocked by this uh, particular lecture will see that I'm in fact attending today disabled on purpose out of support. I came off my bicycle and had an operation last week, so I think I should get a round of applause for that. Um, just kidding. Uh, today the panellists uh, are one short. You will see we have a missing chair. And uh, we were hoping that Gail Rankin would be able to be here, but unfortunately she's been, uh, I understand, in Sydney. Uh, performing one of the functions that she has as, as uh, the chairperson of the First People's Disability Network and wasn't able to come back. Um, unfortunately, she's not able to be with us today. The first panellist I'll introduce is Truffy McGuinness. Truffy, if you could just wave so we all know who you are. Thank you. Uh, Truffy is currently working for the Health and Community Services Complaint Commissioner's Office as the Less Silent, More Safety Project Officer. She's a sister to three brothers, two of whom are deaf and one had profound disabilities from birth. Her family experience and many years of working alongside people who live with disability and the people who love them uh, has filled her heart with joy and deep understanding of why we must do better for them. Mike Taggart, you going to wave? Thank you, Mike. Um, brings to us a background as a City of Salisbury Inclusion Officer since 1997 a member of the Independent Advisory Council for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. He received the 2009 D National Disability Award Local Government category. He was a member of the South Australian Government delegation to the Disability Minister's National Forum this year. 
He wants to learn how to enable organisational cultures to be inclusive of population diversity. He believes that the Council of Australian Government's National Disability Strategy can expand mainstream inclusion if there is uh, a modest recurrent funding commitment. So I suppose it really does boil down to more money, doesn't it? Um, Nick Shumi is a qualified youth worker, waving to you at the end. Specialising in young people with disability, Nick has a wide range of experience working in multiple roles within the sector, including the founding member of the Youth and Disability Advisory Committee and Mentoring Program. He's also a member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, Students with Disabilities, a Disability Case Manager and a supporter of Dignity for the Disabled, where he had the great honour of being a candidate at the last state election here in South Australia. Uh, Anne Gale, in the middle, is the chairperson, sorry, is the uh, commissioner for equal opportunity in South Australia. And she's had that role since 2012. She came uh, to that position, um, sorry, I'll, I'll tell you first of all what the role is, and that is she's responsible for resolving state-based complaints of discrimination, for providing community education and training on matters relating to equal opportunity and discrimination. Uh, she came to the position um, from the previous role that she had as a Deputy Commissioner of Consumer and Business Services and Deputy Chief Executive SA Department for Families and Communities, responsible for ageing, disability, housing policy and services. In her current role, Anne works to address inequality and discrimination with current priorities being age discrimination, people with disability, gender inequity and race discrimination. And as a Deputy President of the Board of Tutti Arts and a Board Member for Access to Place, a community housing organisation for people with disabilities. And I know Hassan's already been introduced, but I'll do it as well. Hassan Apiad, uh, as well as his role of being the Deputy Lord Mayor, he's an entrepreneur with a thirst for seeing his community thrive. Though born in Adelaide, he spent most of his life living in Lebanon, returning to Australia at the age of 19 with his family after living through a civil war. Hassam established Digimod Australia in 2001 while at university and he's seen it grow into one of the largest telecommunications companies in Australia. He then established more successful SA businesses ranging from hospitality to digital marketing and web services to property development. He has had board positions with organisations such as the Migrant Resource Centre, Australian Refugee Association, where we first met, United for Peace and Engineers Without Borders. He was also involved in relation to Australian Friends of Palestine. So I welcome the panel to this wonderful discussion that we're now going to have and ask you to show <coughs> your appreciation for their attending here today. Now, our hypothetical uh, concerns a, uh, a story of a young woman, a young, successful, white, middle-class woman who had a very professional life. She was a successful athlete, she had her own business, and she was a daughter of one of Adelaide's biggest property owners. But she was very quick to point out that her hard work and her successes were all her own due to her determination and hard work, not because of who her father was. So she wasn't a lawyer. In her younger days, she represented Australia in the Commonwealth Games in the Hurdles Division became, and got a third place. And despite her busy schedule, she was still able to work out every day and run every day. Like Megan, she was an elected member of the City Council and she prided herself on being able to identify with the thoughts, feelings and attitudes of others. One day, in a rush to get to a meeting, she ran up some stairs while at the same time talking on her mobile phone. She wasn't concentrating. She was probably wearing high heels. She tripped and reached out to <laughs> save herself from falling, dropped her phone, and that's the last thing she remembers. She woke up in hospital. She was in an induced coma due to serious brain swelling from the fall, but worse still, she had broken her back. Antonia is now a paraplegic. So, we, she will have a range of problems in relation to fitting back into her community and into a working life. And for the hypothetical today, we've divided this into various topics. And the first topic 
that I would like the panellists to tell you about is the question of housing accessibility. You see, three months after her accident, Antonia was taken out of her care environment. She was in rehabilitation till that time. But she couldn't go back to her beautiful high-rise apartment because it didn't have wheelchair access. She rented that out and she's starting to look for somewhere else to live. Is that going to be easy for her? Nick, are you able to help the audience with, uh, with answering the question, how easy will it be for Antonia to find wheelchair accessible rental housing within the city of Adelaide? Sure. Um, I guess there's a, a myriad of, of things to be you know, to think about um, in regards to um, actually accessing that housing and what will actually be needed. And um, as a wheelchair user myself, um, I'll just let you know I've had my um, my physical disability since birth, so this scenario is a little bit different to my own experience. Um, but in terms of um, I can imagine, and I'm sure that there's people in this room right now that could um, attest to this, but obviously acquiring your disability at a later time can be um, quite the journey in itself. Um, so uh, I would hope within the time that she was ready to sort of move somewhere else that she would have some other sort of, um, I guess, services around her to teach her uh, what what she would need um, to actually live independently. In so she wouldn't be alone in this quest? I should hope not. Okay, so if she needed to access a service that would help her find housing where she would be able to get into, into the accommodation with her wheelchair, which service would be able to assist her with that? Um, I guess um, um, places like Disability SA mm. would hopefully be able to assist with that. And I know that there's some people laughing already in this room, which I can understand. I can, does anyone want to talk about why they might be laughing? <laughs> no, we're not here to be negative. No, exactly. We're here to learn. Thank you. So, exactly. so you would hope that she would have people around her who have skills already, because this is a new phase of her life, who might be able to assist. And, and I'm not only speaking from um, an agency's point of view. Um, I think, um, obviously, um, that was explained before with my experience with um, a mentor program. That mentor program in itself is um, a peer-to-peer -peer mentor program. So it's it's um, by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. So I think. My, where I come from, there's a lot of learning that can happen from people that are, um, have that experience of living independently and, and I guess, paving the way to, for other people um, and getting all the right things like um, rails and bathrooms and all those sort of generic things is important as well. So it's changing their the home space as well. And Truffy, what's your view about how she would go about finding accommodation? It's very interesting because part of the theme of uh, this year's International Day for People with Disabilities is, is the business of access and inclusion and um, having access to information and people gathering up the data that they need to make decisions. And I've discovered that, um, I mean, Housing SA is, is a place that you would go to chat about housing. They don't keep any, they don't give out information on what um, accessible housing they have. The community housing doesn't keep data on how many houses that are accessible um, in terms of social housing in South Australia. So it's really interesting that, that for her to go and chat to Housing SA may result in, well, we can't tell you anything. She would, of course, apply. She would have an assessment on what her needs are. The fact that she owns an expensive apartment would go against her because there's an assets test of $348,000. Um, I suspect. Uh, that, that doesn't necessarily preclude you from getting a housing SA or community or social housing, but it would be something that would, could be a barrier. And I suspect that despite her, her proud independence may also need consultation with her father, a man with connections in property. Mm -hmm. I think I suspect that will be the area where she gets access to a house that that she can live in, mm -hmm. and to chat to people like Nick, etc., about. What do I need to think about? Because this is completely new for her. And of course, completely. occupational therapists, of course, provide their expert advice on what the space yeah. should look like. But in but terms of it not looking like a hospital ward, no. talk, talking to people that, that Nick's chatting mm. about to make it a home, that would be important, and the peer support. And yeah. Hassan, does the, does the City Council have a role in relation to 
and making sure that there are enough accessible housing units and accommodations available for people like Antonia? Look, definitely. I think the focus of council is at a policy level as well. So what can we do in the way of policy when it comes to public realm, accessibility, streets, footpath, uh, but also through the development plan, working with the state government to try to uh, also manage some of those concerns. Mm. Um, look, it's something that um, is definitely high on our priority and agenda, and we have very active councillors and also admin staff that are constantly bringing up the issue of inclusivity and access. Uh, so it's quite embedded in a lot of our policy documents, as we discuss, even for simple events within the city, recreational events within the city. Uh, we've just spent a substantial amount of time in Victoria Park addressing a lot of those concerns and issues as well. But what about the actual issue of ensuring that development includes some uh, accommodation that in fact will be wheelchair accessible for uh, for someone renting or using that property or buying that property? Well, if we're talking about new developments, it depends on what scale, if it's over yes. 10 million or under 10 That's, million. It goes um, to the local government. So there is, government. There, is some, um, there is some overlap there and there's a mm. discussion to be had, but look, it's something that we've always pushed for and uh, requested from the state government from a development plan perspective to be included. Right. So Antonia was very lucky. She probably took the advice of Nick and also had a chat to her dad. And she was able to get some accommodation that was accessible to her. Um, she had to pay removalists to pack and clear out the belongings from her penthouse apartment so it would be rented out. When she had her accident, she was lucky that a member of the public had witnessed it because, of course, she had no memory, and that person called an ambulance. And he told them what had happened, namely, she's on her phone, she's running upstairs. And so any question of the liability of the council was out. She, I think she was coming to a meeting here. No compensation. And unfortunately, she hadn't done what um, many sole business practitioners always do and have income insurance. So unlike a motor vehicle accident or some other personal injuries claim, which is some of the work I do, a person can expect at the end of a court hearing, if they're not a court hearing or a mediation, if they're not at fault, to have a large payout and some interim payments made, perhaps, um, on an ongoing basis, she isn't going to get any money. So she is in a very negative position. Um, she's cursing herself in relation to not taking out that uh, income insurance. She sells her business because she can't operate it. She lost money on the sale. She realises, after she's in her accommodation, that having a disability costs more than it did before she became disabled. So, Mike, what can you tell us about the added cost that having a disability is for people that have the disabilities? And secondly, what the National Disability Insurance Scheme is trying to change in terms of assisting people who have a disability? Thanks, Claire. I think the first thing is that each individual person's experience of an impairment and the, uh, and the circumstances they live in will radically affect the amount of money um, that they need to survive. Um, obviously, you know, people who are in better off families, they will have some income sources and stuff, but the actual raw costs, whether you're very wealthy or whether you're very poor, the raw costs can be pretty similar. For example, you need to buy equipment, um, it might be, in her case, a wheelchair. You may well be able to get that through the existing um, uh, disability services systems, but you'll probably wait a long time. But more importantly, a lot of the other things you need, adaptations in your house. So it's good to have a house if it's wheelchair accessible, but how about all the appliances therein? Um, how about modifications, say, to your vehicle if you drive? Um, or, for whatever reason, if you... Um, have to use you know, taxis and things like that. So a lot of transport related costs as well as home based, um, getting on with life type costs. And also um, because, our, uh, because what disables people most is actually the physical inadequacies of our environment or the communication, the lack of communication mm -hmm. um, about you know, accessibility, things like that. People have to spend a lot of time making up for that social deficit um, that belongs to society mm. to get themselves around in an efficient way and trying to keep healthy. And the sum total of all that is for many people, both physical and mental health can be undermined, which has its own unique set of costs as well. 
And how does the insurance scheme that NDIS intend to pick up and yeah. relieve people of the burden, the added burden? Right. I, I, it's a really great question for this time. If, for, for today, uh, while we are still in the trial phase in South Australia of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, um, her story would not be a happy one. Um, some of the laughter earlier on in, during Nick's comments um, I think could be applied to a whole lot of other areas of assistance you might need. But the National Disability Insurance Scheme will fix a couple of things about the system we have today. One, and in some ways the least important, is that the system we have today is broke. There's not enough money in that system. And so many people, like Antonia, scramble for resources on an annual budget basis, depending on what the state governments can manage to find, and many mm. don't make it. But more importantly, the system we have at the moment is broken, and the NDIS will fix that in two main ways. One is that people will have a lifetime entitlement to a level of funding, individual funded packages, if they're eligible to participate in the scheme, they have an individual funded package which reflects what is the cost of reasonable and necessary support to live an ordinary life, such as they might have lived if they didn't have the particular incident, accident, whatever. Mm. They will also have the opportunity um, to have that income, um, uh, uh, sorry, to have that support um, uh, available to them at their choice, in their control, in such a way that early intervention is uh, going to be possible. So you don't have to say, oh, look, we can't afford big upfront costs, even if those big upfront costs would actually mean that later in life you need much less maintenance and support. So the National Disability Insurance Scheme will provide a whole-of-life insurance scheme which makes it sensible to invest early and so that your reasonable and necessary supports in the future can be not just maintenance, getting out of bed, catching a cab or whatever it might be, but can be developmental and growth oriented. Thank you. Um, the next topic we want the panellists to cover is the issue of the experience and language of disability. Coming to terms with her new life, Antonia starts to engage within the disability community. She starts researching disability and what it means to people, and she's shocked to find that there are many barriers. She's never been denied access to anything before, never even considered the various difficulties that people might face. She had thought that she was knowledgeable about human rights, but she admits to herself that when it came to disability, she'd had a very much one-size-fits-all approach. She joins an online group where people with all sorts of disabilities support each other and out businesses and persons and places that are not so, uh, not, not places that are, there are places that make life difficult. A word that she'd never heard before, ableism, is being used and she joins in discussions on how disability is a social construct, how it is barriers that cause people to be disabled rather than an individual situation. Words begin to intrigue Antonia. She thinks about words like invalid. How can a person not be valid? She thinks about disabled. Dis means to reverse abled. All of these words promote such negative perceptions. When she first had her accident, there was a lot of media attention, which is the time which at that time she didn't engage with. But she now looks back over some of the headlines from the advertiser. One article read, former athlete and city councillor now wheelchair bound after freak accident. So, Nick, how important do you think language is when people talk about disability? And how do you feel about that advertiser headline? That's great. Um, to me, language is hugely important. I think uh, in, in regards to that headline, um, Everybody's heard that headline before, mm. and there's uh, lots of reasons for that. Um, the media likes to um, make things more flamboyant, and and um, they go with that angle, like the whole, you know, we talk about people with disabilities, and they say d d um, wheelchair bound, and and mm. you know all those sorts of things. Um, I think we need to steer away from that as a society, um, but. We understand that the media does that to get attention. Mm. We, as a society of people with disabilities ourselves, if that's what we represent, 
we have to let it be known that we're not okay with that. Um, and it's not just about, I know a headline is, is specifically about a headline, but it's not about that. It's permitting that it kind is. of language, isn't it? It is. Um, Anne Gale, you're the commissioner mm -hmm. in South Australia that's supposed to ensure that um, the people, for the purpose of this discussion, who have disability are not discriminated against. Are you able to tell the members here just briefly what your role is in relation to discrimination for, for disability areas? Uh, okay. Um, I can take complaints of um, unfair treatment. So a person may experience unfair treatment and therefore it dis could be discrimination mm. and they are able to lodge a complaint with the Commission. I guess the first thing is to say it must be complaint by that person, so you can't lodge a complaint on behalf of or a group of people, um, that the people must have uh, experienced the discrimination themselves, so that's the first thing. Um, the Act deals with 14 grounds of discrimination, you know, race, age, sex, mm -hmm. gender, chosen gender, um, pregnancy, caring responsibilities, and disability is one of those 14. Um, it is a broad definition under the Act, which is good in that it's very inclusive, um, and so um, people with uh, a whole range of disabilities are able to come to us to seek advice, help, and possibly uh, dispute resolution around their complaint. It must be in a public area, however. So what I mean by public area is this um, discrimination or unfair treatment that someone's <laughs> felt must have occurred in one of five or six public areas like um, employment, um, goods and services, so out in the community buying mm. services, purchasing goods, um, in education um, and in accommodation, sale of land and qualifications. Oh. So it's got to be a public area and if it's outside of that I can't deal with it. So you've been in that role now since 2012 mm. and so what are the, the, the common complaints or some of the complaints that your office has had to deal with yeah, sure. in particular in relation to disability complaints? Yeah, Disability complaints make up at least one third of our complaints um, ranging over the last couple of years, two to three years, 32%, 37% and last financial year 34%. So it is dominant, it's mm. our biggest area of complaint. Um, most of those complaints, or well, 42% of those complaints relate to employment. So that's in the workplace where people's um, disability is not being accommodated, both physically and often through hours of work, not being accommodated in, in that sense. The um, second area is goods and services, so disability complaints, 39% of those complaints relate to goods and services, and that's often access to premises, um, you know, or um, not services not being provided in an appropriate way for people, um, and right down to, you know, therapeutic animals being allowed in to particular facilities or services. Mm -hmm. And the third area is for education, and this is actually a growing area, so 14% of our disability complaints related to education. And when I first started in the role, it was something like 4%, and you know, so it's growing. We see a lot of students now, um, voices coming forward about how students are treated in um, all forms of educational institutions, right through from, um, you know, pre-entry or low-level low entry right through to tertiary and it's often about learning plans not being followed. And the other angle is often the confusion or the debate around uh, behaviour. So a child with disability uh, might be excluded from certain things in the school or ex 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 um, you know, excluded on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis because of their, dis uh, their behaviour but the family or might allege that it's the um, disability that's caused the behaviour. So that's an emerging area mm. that I see a, a bit of a trend um, in. Oh, thank you. Um, Truffy, mm. often we focus on physical impairments that are obvious to us and, um, and they can be easier to identify. What about the experience of those whose disability is not as obvious? From your experience with your family and working alongside people, who have disabilities, what do you see as some of the biggest barriers to their participation? Um, what I've noticed and when I hear the powerful stories that I hear from people who live with a disability, it's the attitudes of able people and, and the assumptions that uh, people who don't live with a disability make about someone who has a disability. 
Um, and for me, the big thing about how you allow more participation is to actually have make connections with, have relationships, have friendships with people who live with a disability. And that's the thing that changes the world, actually having real relationships with people so you find out about what their day-to-day -day life is really like rather than what those headlines say, what those ideas that people suffer from a disability, all that language that is so demeaning and undermining of people. Um, and like both my brothers are deaf, and the deaf community is very bloody stroppy, let me tell you. <laughs> they stick up for themselves big time. And I'm wandering around, I see deaf people around Adelaide all the time because of how they communicate. Um, so they're a bit easier to spot. Folk who have um, sight impairment, who are blind, are, are, can be easy to spot. People with intellectual disability, perhaps less so. And, and I think that often those folk with intellectual or cognitive disability are the ones who suffer really enormous daily humiliations because people assume that they're really stupid. And they're not. They're marvellous. They, they live lives of great courage and endeavour. And so my encouragement about overcoming barriers is for us able-bodied people to overcome our assumptions and our discomfort and our fear and actually get to know people find out about them, hang about with them, and love them to bits. That would be a bit from so me. So ignorance is the barrier. Oh, attitudes and ignorance yes. and low expectations. They destroy people. Hmm. Thank you. That was a very moving answer. Um, the next topic that we would like to take the panellists to, using Antonia's terrible situation, is the way that she can get around the city. She is now in a headspace where she wants to become more active in the community again. She was formerly and that hasn't changed. She wants to resume her role as an elected member. She thinks she has so much more to offer now with this added particular experience that she has, in particular in regards to access. She contacts a fellow councillor to help her prepare for a return to meetings. Together they do a test run of the path from her apartment in the southwest of the city to the town hall before the next meeting. This will include her having to go past a range of cafes and shops that utilise the footpath for their activities. People who have heard about her return to council have started to contact her about their experience. They see her as a possible advocate for them and the barriers that they face in the city. So Nick, Using a manual wheelchair, what are some of the barriers or challenges that Antonia can expect on her first outdoor experience trying to navigate from her apartment to the town hall? Well, I guess there's, there are a lot of things that you don't even really consider um, may be an issue. Um, one of the things I like to think about is, um, you know, it's really good. I think we, we do have a, um, a pretty good um, public transport system here in Adelaide. Um, but it's not only about making the, the train or tram accessible, it's about from where, where that tram stops is great if you can get on and off that without too many hassles, that's awesome. But it, uh, it's about can I actually get to from there to where I need to be right. uh, is important. So, um, and it's, I guess, the one of the things that I, I, I come up against um, quite regularly just going around the place. Um, you know, in, in some ways it's it's good that people um, will ask you to, uh, a lot of people will ask you, do you need help with this? If they can see that you're maybe struggling with it, with a, um, a step or something that you're, you're struggling with. But a lot of the time people don't just ask. They, they, they interpret that you might be struggling, which you may not, may or may not be. Um, sometimes with my physical disability, sometimes I know I look awkward when I'm doing something. That's just my way of doing it. Um, and people just automatically, they may ask you, but they actually ask you while they're helping you or why they seem to be helping you. So they're actually moving you physically and being on your person before they've actually even asked you. Um, so I come from the point of I'd rather have somebody ask me before actually doing. Mm. So if she was, if she was trying to navigate around the city streets. What are going to be some of the physical problems that she has? She doesn't want to get the bus. She's a former runner. She wants to make sure that she walks as, or yep. ro wheels as much as she can. What are going to be her problems on the pavements of Adelaide? Uh, I guess just um, um, uneven surfaces right. uh, are one thing. Um, the other thing is it, it, um, 
with up and down ramps from curbs and things like that. Um, they do exist, but some some are better than others. Um, and there are there are a lot of times where you have um, maybe you have a down ramp to go um, down on, to cross the street, and sometimes there's just not one on the other side. Oh right. So what what do you do then? Um, so those sorts of things. Turn around and go back ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about tram lines? That's how I did this. <laughs> Wheeling across tram lines, is that a problem? So uh, it's with bicycles, I can tell you that. Um, it, it all depends on, on the, the, the setup of chair. I don't really have that many issues with my chair myself. Um, but I know, um, and again, those things, are, it depends where you cross as well. Sometimes they're smoother than others. So it's a lot of forward planning for Antonia then. She's going to Absolutely. work out where the best routes are, the ones which has the complementary uh, down and up ramps, et cetera. Absolutely. And, and what, what does end up happening is that you, um, you actually trial something multiple times and you find out the best way for you, for your ability. And you go that that way as long as it's somewhere that you you frequent. And you've also got that other element of um, if there's roadworks, um, if you've got roadworks on your normal route, you've, you, that's obviously going to throw some spanner in the works as well. Um, and in relation to this issue of accessibility, what are some of the complaints that the commission has received or you've received in your office from persons with disabilities who have been um, not able to get from A to B or access services or facilities? Yeah, um, it can be accessing the restaurant with um, what continues to amaze me with the guide dog. You know, I thought we'd moved past that. But occasionally we will get um, some restaurants who don't understand that animals like guide dogs can come in. So that comes up occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, it's moving around caravan parks um, where wheelchair accessibility is not there, um, accessible toilets aren't there. So um, access to buildings um, with steps and uh, really simple things like ramps not being in place. Um, so in terms of physical buildings, it's, they're the sorts of things and it's, it's in a variety of circumstances. As I said, it's uh, leisure centres, I won't name anybody obviously, but you know, highly reputable tourist centres not having accessibility for wheelchairs. So, you know. And Mike, you've got experience in this area, haven't you, in local government and in a range of uh, other adv advocacy roles. What are some of the issues that get raised by people who want to get out and about in their local area? Yeah, I think about this in perhaps under three headings. Um, I, I call them getting around, getting on, and getting between or to and from. Mm -hmm. With getting around, one of the things that Salisbury Council, I uh, suspect others, but that residents have said for a long time, but in the last five or six years, more of them, more stridently, is that we have to get design right from the inception of any new project, be it you know, a massive subdivision um, or a building, a park, a library service, um, a, a recreation service. So both programs and also the actual physical places where they happen. And getting the design right, not just for that element, but also for the land surrounding it. So we've had examples at Salisbury where we've got really, really good, more than minimum access to a new building um, or a refurbished building, but no wheelchair access from the local footpath, bus mm. stop and car park. So we're saying to the proponents of those projects, you can't just focus on what you want to achieve, you've got to also plan for and budget for the context that that park or building is in. Mm. So that's getting around. Getting on, and I, this has been pretty well covered, I think, by Truffy and Nick, mm -hmm. that is, they're saying that, especially for our council staff, um, that they don't want to have to begin at the beginning every time they meet a council staff member to get across the idea that they're not poor, helpless people with disability, that they have some dignity and that they actually are, you know, in their own words, perhaps not in their own words, but champions who, have, who are dealing with some quite challenging environments that they have to master because we haven't provided them in the past. Um, and so to have the dignity, but also that the staff have the knowledge, at least, that people with disability are not somehow second class citizens, but are people who are having to deal with a world which is not designed for their easy access. Mm. And finally, getting to or getting between places 
people really struggle, and some of this is not local government, it's not other levels of government, and I think it's a community too, not just all about government, to get from home to an activity you might want to do. If you don't drive a car, especially seniors, you know, they have to give up their licences. Mobility scooters are great, but do the footpaths and ramps allow them to get to those places? Can they afford the taxis mm. and those sorts of things? So those three areas, getting around a place, getting on with people in the place, so you're not having to sort of always be the poor person with disability, but actually just another citizen, and getting to and from places is really critical things. Mike, this is a question I was going to ask Gail, but I'm wondering if you might answer it. Um, if you had the opportunity to sit down with, uh, with a, a person like Antonia, um, what would you think she should be trying to try and change within the local council area as an elected member? Okay. I think requiring that the administration and the elected members, council themselves, have an engagement with people living with disability at each stage of really major projects and programs early on. So that they might not be professional architects or access consultants even, though those are really important, um, but that they get the feelings and experience of those people living with disability before they commit to the budget and the plan that's going to roll out later on. Because if you don't do that, in the end, you end up having to fix it later. Well, Truffy, that relates to what you were saying earlier about the need to communicate and engage yep. to demystify and break down some barriers. Yep. So you would be happy if mm -hmm. councils um, were more engaging with people in this sector across oh, the board. Indeed, mm. because folk are, they know their lives mm. and so they can speak of their lives as experts. Mm. So one thing that mm. people in our council area have said about this is the importance of employing more people across the range of occupations within local government people living with disability, because it's actually that's the best way to educate your staff. Of course. Did you want to add something about that, Sam? Yeah, look, just briefly, and it's a great comment that was brought, in, uh, brought up earlier. Um, one of the things we actually did on the Rundlemore project and Victoria Square, being that there were new projects, yeah. is actually adopted those exact same policies, and the feedback we've received was quite amazing. Uh, that's good. You know, we, we actually adopted that as a council, but there's been some great ideas coming out of here as well around potential um, auditing accessibility around the city every now and again and understanding those routes, maybe digitising some of those routes online so people can have a better understanding to what works and doesn't work and some great ideas. And I think, Nick, you're probably going to have a date now with us, Sam, or you'll go out um, and point um, out all those and down and up ramps. I'm so. fine with that. Let's do that. Yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> We've achieved something. Um, the next topic we want to, um, to raise with you tonight is the issue of entertainment and going out. And I know that some of the panellists have already discussed this um, in some way, but uh, that idea of being included in the community I think has been raised by all the panel members in one way or the other. Antonia's situation has changed considerably since her accident and her knowledge about barriers that people with disability face has grown enormously. There is one issue about which she was once an outspoken advocate and that was maintaining the beautiful heritage buildings in Adelaide. Saying it is this that makes Adelaide a unique and beautiful city to live in. She goes back to her one-time favourite restaurant, a trendy little supper lounge called the Lizard Lounge. She forgot that there were steps to the small toilet facilities, which are about a gorgeous blue stone wall and a grapevine that's over 100 years old. When she raises the inaccessibility of that toilet with the owner, she's surprised by his response that she should just go somewhere else and that the heritage value of the wall and grapevine is more important than a toilet for her. He said he couldn't afford to make the changes that would be necessary in any event. After that experience, Antonia looks for somewhere else to have her upcoming birthday drinks and dinner. She calls around a few different places in the city to ask about wheelchair access. And after being reassured the restaurant is accessible, she books at a new Greek place that's just opened up. When she gets there, she finds that her wheelchair won't fit between the tables, which are squashed in tight, and when she goes to use the accessible bathroom, she can't transfer from her wheelchair because it's also being used as a storeroom and for all the cleaning products. There are boxes of supplies around her. So, and from a legal perspective. Mm. First of all, the lizard lounge owner, he gets away with not having an accessible toilet. 
What, what is that about the argument between heritage, which we know on this particular council is a very live topic, and the importance of access for people who need to be able to use facilities? This is, uh, How do you deal with it? Oh, this is a challenging area. Um, essentially, the Lizard Lounge owner should not be able to get away with it. So any public place, restaurant like that, providing a public service, should be providing accessibility. <coughs> That's the short of it. However, there's a long part of it as well, which is really yeah. quite. First thing I'd say is for someone like uh, Lizard Lounge to be challenged about that, Antonia needs to lodge a complaint. Right. So that's so, what you were saying earlier about it has to be the actual person yeah. affected by the discrimination. Yeah, and that's right. both with the Disability Discrimination Act federally and state-based. Right. So it's not that there's the um, accessibility police going around checking out venues. They don't exist. This is my point. So mm. it has to be, oh, Antonia can't get in. She needs to lodge a complaint. Now, he, he or she, Lizard Lounge owners, could um, have a form of um, defence in the sense of unjustifiable hardship. And this is what, and heritage. Mm. So there'll be two lines. So um, I guess what I could say is Lizard Lounge, Lizard Lounge owners could trump the car, this is heritage, yeah. and people go, oh dear, oh, well, I've got no choice, and go away, because they don't know. Any, any better. Mm -hmm. So we encourage people to take that on and perhaps lodge a complaint or go to the, the council to get advice about that. Um, Lizard Lounge owner could say, this is going to cost me too much money. Unjustifiable hardship. And that can be used by someone to not undertake, um, a, I guess, accommodation for people. And so it's a it's not straightforward, so if a complaint came forward, if that, say Lizard Lounge had made a lot of effort, which doesn't sound like he or she has, no. but if they had made a lot of effort and it was absolutely justified why both cost and heritage and a whole range of reasons, then that person may be able to get away with it, may. Mm. But we would, you know, on what the information we've got, you know, Antonio should take them on, Lizard Lounge should have to present the onus is on Lizard Lounge to say why it's the onus is on them, why it's unjustifiable hardship, and we get the matter heard and dealt with. And uh, when they come forward to us, most of the Lizard Lounge people come to the party. Right. And they can't they use... They get an architect it. in, they find out how to preserve the blue stone and the vine, yeah. and yeah. they They have to get spend some money, time mm. and effort to do that. The trouble is most people don't know that that can happen. It's probably cost less than the lawyers to challenge it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm protecting my own business here. Um, <laughs> so is that clear? That's cl it's clear. It's a tricky yeah. area. There, there are defences to it, but you're advising people to make sure that people lodge complaints, even if the owner does say, look, I don't have to because of heritage reasons, to then get expert advice from your office. Yeah. Is that right? There's, a, there's no formal mechanism that goes around and checks that accessibility. No. There is, you know, for new buildings, there's certain requirements. Yes. In renovations, there's requirements. But anything sort of old, there's not the sort of heritage or the, you know, accessibility police out there checking it out. And Nick, that experience that Antonia had going into the Greek restaurant where she was told it was wheelchair accessible because it had a ramp and a toilet, but in fact you couldn't get around the tables, you couldn't get to the bar, is that something you've experienced in places? That is definitely something that I've experienced and a lot of people in this room and I'm sure other people that are listening have, have experienced plenty of those things, yes. And do you confront the owners or the, or the managers of businesses? Absolutely, and I think that's partly one uh, one of my reasons for um, sort of uh, sp trying to specialise in working with people, and especially young people, to to be really confident people to advocate for themselves about what is important, have have the skills, and not to be frightened to say, oh, um, if I talk about this, what the issue that I'm having, I'm just going to be a nuisance. No, you're actually making it better for yourself and somebody else. So it's it's important to be. Um, I guess confident enough to to raise those things. Not not, and you have to do it in a certain way. Uh, it's all it's very easy to get very annoyed and go straight for the jugular, which is it does happen sometimes. Yes. But it's about it's about raising those issues in a, the right way to make it better for yourself and others. Um, one thing that happens in the gender area, particular in relation to law, is that badging the organisations that do it right can actually be a positive rather than outing that do it wrong. So 
in a way, you can spread, I guess, amongst your your um, your friends and associates those businesses that do it properly. Mm. Um, and I assume, Mike, that it's it's particularly difficult for someone whose vision is impaired or indeed they are blind to dine out, attend facilities and functions. Um, mm -hmm. What experience have you personally had that yeah. could assist this evening? Yeah, I don't dine alone. I'm very fortunate. I'm married and have a partner, Kathy, my wife, who is happy to dine with me, and children, ditto. Um, but even so, um, there are things I guess we'd consider, um, and I think that idea of badging good practice would be a really good thing to be able to do. Um, for example, I go somewhere, I'd prefer to go somewhere where it wasn't hectically noisy because mm. compared with most other people there, I depend on hearing for good conversation, which is half the reason, I, well maybe a third of the reason. I go to a restaurant other than the food and the wine. Um, <laughs> so, so that's a bit of a selection process. But the point of the crowded um, spaces and tables, well, as you saw, Anne um, guided me up here, the more cluttered a space is and the narrow it is, it's a tougher gig for a sighted guide person who's guiding me through all that. So I'd like mm -hmm. to go to a place which had a bit of variety. I don't care if some parts of a restaurant, uh, you know, they're packed you know, three deep, but have some parts too which allow a bit more space for mm -hmm. seniors, for people who are blind, vision impaired, have a guide dog, a sighted guide, a wheelchair, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So Hassan, you've you've owned uh, hospitality businesses both in the city council and in Burnside Council, haven't you? Yes. Uh, so, um, what do you think could be done to encourage businesses to become either more aware of the need for accessibility across a range of uh, of disab disabilities, and to encourage business owners then to make changes that might be necessary? Definitely, um, council hat off and business hat on. You just gave me a good business idea, maybe. Accessible cafe. We have room for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I think so maybe there's a business for that. But um, Why not take their dollars. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things um, for us, we, we've had this problem um, in two separate locations uh, with the planning aspect of things. Uh, where it's quite conflicting. So you have the building code that tells you one thing. Um, mm -hmm. Then you have aspects. We've looked at buildings that are older, heritage buildings. And the minute you're looking at that, because it's an exciting location to, to work through, um, the minute the building code's triggered, uh, where you've got to not just look at the accessibility aspect, but also fire, et cetera, there's a whole heap of stuff, exits to look at, suddenly it becomes a very costly exercise for mm -hmm. a small business and an entrepreneur to give it a go. Mm -hmm. So in our latest experience in Burnside five years ago, um, We've, we've, we've sold that business, but one of the things that we've experienced is uh, we had a, a massive um, uh, 150 square metre space uh, inside and also another 100 square metres outside. At the back of the restaurant, we wanted to put a slightly elevated step uh, to be able to have about 10 tables in the area. And we put in our development plan through Burnside that triggered a discussion being it's a, a new shopping centre that well, if you've got to do that, you've got to provide a, an accessible ramp. Um, the first thing we argued as a business is we'll, you know, we've got 30 other tables, it doesn't matter, the whole place needs to be accessible. So we started getting that around our minds. Uh, then we've had to deal with the space. If we had a, an accessible toilet versus using the centre toilet, what does that mean to us? Because at the end of the day for a business, it's got to be a return on investment. Mm. So we're talking numbers, take the emotion out for a second. Uh, but the other part too is around the space and how it's used. Um, and obviously, if you're starting to lose tables, how would you deal with that? And that, that was our biggest challenge. We, we didn't have an opportunity via a grant uh, or via anything to be able to uh, work through. Or, and the other part is also um, the education aspect. We couldn't have anyone hold our hand and explain to us how you'd go about it, uh, which was also very challenging. Um, but these are the areas we've uh, we've looked at. But in both occasions at Felici in the city and also at Burnside, mm. we've we've complied and we've ticked every box, um, and we've had many customers enjoy both uh, businesses um, in that regard. So look, it's it's definitely a worthwhile um, a worthwhile exercise, but it was a very costly one for that matter as well. So um, if you're thinking about if we move on to the area of employment, um, if you're thinking about employing people that. Um, that are disabled, what barriers um, do you face in business and as an owner of a business to employing people with disability? You've mentioned some of the council initiatives, but just putting on the other hat now. Look, it's actually a, a very, um, I've had a, a very enlightening experience recently. Um, uh, Catherine Gill was just in the room earlier from the Royal Society for the Blind. 
Uh, we own a company called Alltech and Digimob, a telecommunication company. We're an authorised service centre for Samsung and, and other brands for mobile phones. Uh, we, um, our HR person put an ad up online. Um, I shared it on Facebook and I had uh, this amazing uh, message from Catherine from the RSB saying, look, I have a client. I'd like you to meet them. Um, and for 15 years being in business, uh, I'll, be, I'll be very honest, I'm actually embarrassed to say this, I've never thought about it. Uh, it's, not, it's nothing that I've actually ever thought about or any of our management team thought about. And I thought to myself, I've been dealing a lot with this in the City Council, um, I'm involved, I'd like to explore my opportunities. So I met with this great lady. Um, she is um, legally blind, she is uh, in her early 20s. And half an hour discussion over coffee, I was empowered. I was so, uh, I can't even explain to you, it was, it was, she was so passionate about her role and what she wants to do. And I think that experience on its own had really changed the way I think about it because what it did for us is a few things in business. When I brought it up at a management meeting, the first thing that was said from other directors is risk. You're a workshop. How do people manage? You know what's going to happen in the area. Our printers, um, uh, size of fonts. There was a whole heap of things we had to address. Um, and um, Jess, which is our, which she's our admin manager. I'm sorry, I'm taking a little bit of time with mm. this, but I'll wrap up quickly. Um, she actually was our little hero in the business that said, "Please give this project to me. I'm going to do it. I want to make. I want to do it." And she's a 24-year-old admin manager that wanted to give this a go. Mm. Um, and automatically, we've seen that transformation in our work culture, so our staff, but most importantly, our customers. Mm. Uh, we have had uh, our customers that are coming in, having to deal uh, with Emily and work with Emily. Uh, we've got a telecommunication business. I don't know, hands up, of how many people would, can live without a phone. So most people are coming in. They're already on an edge. They've got to give the phone back. And customers' temperament, everything about the customer service aspect changed when they found out mm. that you know they are being served by Emily and you know she's taking her time, she's being assisted. And look, for us, she's probably one of our best performing staff. Mm. She's been with us now for the last uh, five, six months and we can't do without her. Well, that's very good insight. Yeah. Um, and I want, I'm wondering if I might ask you about this. Fewer people with disabilities participate in the workforce than those without disabilities. And you told us earlier, that I can't remember the percentage now, but a lot of the complaints you get in the disability factor relate to employment. Many uh, more people with disabilities are underemployed than those without. Since 1993, the labour force participation rate of people with disabilities has actually fallen, which is incredible. When you think that our society might have become more tolerant, and certainly legislation has picked up and made unlawful conduct to discriminate. So why do you think we are going backwards in terms of employment of people with disability and that more employers aren't taking the experience that Hassam just described to us of getting enriched by employing someone with a disability? Attitudes. I think that's a significant um, issue and lack of understanding and lack of exposure and knowing people with lived experience of disability. So you heard. Yes. I had, you know, you met this person and wow. So that, it, that experience really enlightens people. And attitudes to people with disability, you know, we talk about being inclusive, but our country has a long, long way to go mm. to really um, have a better, every person having an understanding and knowing some, a person with disability. I mm. say this to people when I do induction, how many people you know? You know, the people you don't know, you, people you know that you don't know they've got a disability, mm. but a consciousness about that. Yes, okay. So I really think that um, we, we have to push hard on breaking down those barriers, what it is to have a person with disability on, on uh, the workforce, that it's not a costly thing. Like people just go, oh, that's going to cost me too much money mm. to have that person. Mm. And we know through our experience of conciliation with employers, once you talk to them about what the person needs, oh, is that all? is often the outcome mm. and it's not that hard to accommodate people. So we have a lot of unconscious bias still in our community about what it will cost to employ someone, lack of understanding and a lot of you know, barriers and attitudes about what people with disability are capable of doing. And yet they are often the most dedicated, 
you know, committed employees that um, go an extra mile. And it's not just they're the, so happy to have a job. It's not just the private sector, is it? It's the public sector. The public and your yeah. your organisation has just done a 90-day project yeah. trying to increase the number of, mm. of employment opportunities for people with disability in the public sector. Mm. Could you tell us how that yes. went? I was very keen to encourage the public sector because my job goes across both private and public. Yes. Um, but as a the biggest employer in the state and an exemplar, ought to be leading the way. And so knew we have, we're not perhaps performing at our best. Um, so encouraged the government or the had already committed to employing five people with an intellectual disability through a specific initiative. So that hadn't yet been delivered on. So we put forward a 90-day pro project. So this is, you do something in three months and you, to employ five people with an intellectual disability or learning disability, um, look at how we could improve the online awareness training and to develop information and resources for people around employing people with disability. We have um, six people employed with another two to go. And Michael Deegan's here and Dip T have won an award for their efforts and even Michael talks about the experience of just having these people on staff and what it does to other people's awareness. Um, so um, we d we've delivered eight people with employment outcomes. Um, some of them are job share, some of them are not. Mm -hmm. um, and to demonstrate, to put a spotlight on it and to say it's possible. Like that's not a large number in the broader public sector, but it's really important to put the highlight. So now I've got a number of them committing to work with the NDRC over the next 12 months to do further work around this. Right. So it's keeping it on the agenda and in tight economic times, it's very easy for topics mm. of employing people you know, who are in smaller population groups, whether it's Aboriginal people, people with disabilities, it's too hard, it's a nice to do, we haven't got the money. And I'm here saying, stop, you need to still do it. And here's some ways you can do it. Let's hope we can add a zero to that figure by this time next year. Absolutely. Okay, that'll be you up for that, Michael? <laughs> um, Truffy, the federal government recently commissioned a wide-ranging review of the $150 billion welfare system laying out a plan for five basic payments and recommendations tightening the eligibility for disability support. Mm -hmm. Get people back to work, I think they call it. Um, it talked about focusing more on people's capacity to work in assessing which payment they would be eligible for. How do you think this could encourage greater workforce participation for people with disability? Um, I, I find this a very vexed question mm. because one of the things that frustrates me is this mythology that we're spending for much on, on disability support pensions, whereas in fact Australia, there's only Korea and the United States spends less than Australia and the OECD on, on uh, income support for people who live with a disability, mm -hmm. and it's a mere eight, and it's it's outrageous, um, and so, and it's so against why I first came to what drew me to Australia in the first place was my friendship with Australians in London. And I, I was so impressed with that idea of a fair go and a just place. And I feel like some of that has disappeared over the last while with more fear mongering ar around um, who comes to the country with more, um, for me, problematic marginalization of people who don't fit a particular image of what an Australian is whether you're an Aboriginal person, a person with a disability, a newly arrived person, that whole thing, and, and that breaks my heart somewhat. But it, of course it's important to focus on people's capacity, whoever we are, for people to get to know us and find out what is it you do well and how can we make sure you get to do it, so that you live a life of passion and joy and achievement. Um, and to hear those sort of success stories, like that story of Emily, those are the stories that employers need to share amongst each other. Um, and because that becomes the encouragement. You're, you're an influential man as a, as a businessman in South Australia. To share those stories, so important. But I also find it deeply ironic that a time when the government's saying we want to focus on capacity building, we have to get people off pen disability support pensions, etc., that actually there's been a massive decrease in funding to the services that support people with disability to access accommodation and learn how to do the job and then become established as workers. So drives me demented, that's all I can say. So I suppose in, in summary then, what we're talking about here is first of all, and you pointed out that there is no auditing in relation to 
whether there has been discrimination or not. It relies on a complaint-based system. Mm -hmm. And Annette, you told us that you know there's, it's difficult and Hassam's offered to maybe think about the fact that we need to inform ourselves by taking out people that are disabled and, and having them point out what the problems are. So, And that would be like a form of auditing, would it not, if, if it was a proactive council who said, right, we're now going to do an audit of every street within the Adelaide City area to see which is accessible to wheelchairs. Yeah. And, and that would then enable uh, change to occur without a complaint having to be lodged. Absolutely. Is that right? And the community education value that mm. would come from that, you know, would be outstanding. So that leadership of, you know, if it's a council or a business, you know, that's what really will make some of the change. You know, complaint-based, it's sort of a negative-based mm. system. The more proactive the engagement of leadership, it's got to come from the top. Um, and uh, that can really make a big difference to a community. And Trophy, I think the main message that we got from you is that we need to break down the barriers and make mm. conversations, make relationships, yep. and inform ourselves of what the what the what groups need mm. and what they want, and and stop creating an us and them. Is yep. that is that what you would? Think? And, and also the stories that say mm. it's really made a difference to how customers experience coming into my business because I have people who are different working here. Whatever the difference is, and, and Nick, it does make a difference. Yeah, and Nick, your, your uh, very helpful suggestion that the groups that you're dealing with, young people, that they see that they can be empowered if they take on what they see as discrimination against them. Absolutely. Yeah. And finally, Hassam, I suppose you, second to last, sorry, I suppose you're the, the person that's come here um, who can take some of these ideas away and try and achieve change. And you can look to someone like we already have our Salisbury Council Best Practice Council, don't we, who have already streets ahead uh, in terms of some of these changes. Would you agree with that? Have I, have I pitched you too highly? We have got some things done really well, but I'll tell you there are some things we are learning and copying from Adelaide City Council and right. Playford and Campbelltown. Um, but there's a lot of councils, and City of West Torrens, sorry, which is here too, um, um, which are streets ahead of us in some areas. I think one of the things that a few of us, and I think Adelaide City and City of West Torrens and Campbelltown are three best examples and we're trying to follow, is this engagement with building the capacity of people living with disability in their families and the wider community too, to understand how that you know, the external environment is what impacts and disables you and to give people a sense that, yes, they can advocate for themselves in an informed sort of way and engage with senior people in government, private sector, talking from their point of view how you can make your business better mm. by including us in your customer base. How can you make your government better by having us as your staff and managers? Right, so this is a, a surprise question for all the panel members, um, but it won't be difficult for you to answer. I want you to imagine that you've actually all been elected to the Adelaide City Council and you're going to have the majority on one change that you think could make a difference for people in this sector, in, in the area that you're representing. What one change would you like to see uh, occur within the Adelaide City Council, or indeed any council, that would make life better for people that have... Uh, disabilities. Start with you, Nick. Well, you didn't want me to start with you because we started the whole. That's all right. Yeah, that's all right. It was bound to happen. Um, I guess, from my point of view, um, something that I have already done um, is obviously I think organisations and councils, who, or who, whatever group it may be, they, they really do struggle to bring in people with disabilities into that space to say hey, what's it really like? So I would obviously want to champion that. Consultation with the... the consultation. Yeah, and and really yeah. not just a once-off, like, hey, how's things going and all those sort of things, like an ongoing um, consultation to say, this is this is how it is. Right. This is, as a group, this is what we've decided that, you know, we we think we need to be working on and actually let the people champion that. I can't imagine a better answer, but I'm going to keep going down the panel. Trophy, what would you do? Um, I work just beside Rundle Mall, and so I wander around there, but at lunchtime. And Rundle Mall is chock-a-block with people who live with a disability, just doing life. They're not special people, they're not inspirational, they're not suffering, they're just doing life. Mm. And there's iconic places all around the city that the council uses to represent this as a dynamic 
diverse, innovative, sorry, I'm quoting, am I quoting Malcolm Turnbull? I better be careful. But, um, you, you know, and, but when I look at those images of, of the diverse, innovative, mm. wonderful place, I don't see the folk that I see wandering up and down um, and wheeling up and down mm. and chatting up and down with their hands of their death in Rundle Mall or the Adelaide Central Markets or the Botanic Gardens or wherever. I'd like to see them in the promotional stuff that Adelaide City Council has because people are in the city doing life every day who live with Excellent. a disability. Very mm. good. Anne, what would you like to see as a one change? Apart from more money to your office, obviously. Everyone in government <laughs> always says that. <laughs> uh, I, look, I'm going to go to the employment angle. It's very, very hard to pick one thing. But yeah. I think if your staff reflect your community, and it is that exposure to people understanding what it's like mm. um, having staff on uh, in greater numbers, in greater numbers, not oh. one or two, mm. you know, having a strong staff uh, profile of people with disability employment strategy, then that's going to influence everything you do because the staff are going to speak to every action mm. that the council wants to undertake and you'll hear the, vis vis uh, the disability voice in the organisation speaking for that's the community. Too, yeah. That's very good. Mike, what do you think? Wow, where we've got ongoing engagement from Nick, reflecting to the community the reality of the value of participation by people with disability, yeah. employment of people inside the organisation itself, where have I got left to go? <laughs> <laughs> I feel... I think those nightclubs and restaurants <laughs> need some fixing. Yeah, rest, yeah. Entertainment and... <laughs> Oh, I am tempted to go to a boring area, which is yeah. requiring that council administration actually put together processes which show how universal design and inclusion mm. in all things are going to be both done and measured over time, connecting up with the employees yeah. and the ongoing engagement. So it's the ongoing auditing of change. Yeah, well, the process to start it process going start and ongoing it. engagement about mm. its progress. Yep. And acting mayor? <laughs> if I I'm ever elected to the Adelaide City the Council. <laughs> no, the question is, what will you be doing? <laughs> I think one of the most important things is really providing leadership, um, and that is that yes. is something that is really important. Uh, and I think it comes from both uh, both sides. We're not a, we will not be a successful community if we don't look after every single member in our community. I mean, there's a lot of shame to be pointed at if we don't do that. And I think for us, we have a very important role to play in leadership and in education in our community so we can make all these things work. Thank you. And I think one obvious commitment the council has is to hold this event. So that's obvious that they want to engage with some communication. Just before I um, ask you all to thank the panellists today, can I just thank Sue for writing this problem? I know I've tweaked it a little bit, sorry. Um, <laughs> for writing this problem and thank once again the panellists for coming tonight and, uh, and providing such wonderful insight into where change could be in the future. Thank you. Gentlemen, it's my uh, final duty to, um, to I think, give some gifts. Give some gifts. Auditing, therefore, is important. Yeah. Most certainly. Nick McGarkis, Adelaide Central Market.
they really considered that. And, and actually, well done, Nick. Well done, Nick. Thank you. Wait for the extra customers. They'll come in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, look, I, I, um, I'm going to hand out the gifts one by one, and I'll ask you to thank me with your applause. Thank them with uh, your applause when, when I do that. But I just wanted to um, make a couple of comments, a um, couple of personal comments. Apart from the fact that I was taking very careful notes in response to Claire's last question, so I've got my list of things that we're going to have to address. There are a couple of things that really uh, rang true for me, uh, you know, but there were the sort of eye-openers for me. One was the notion, I think it was Mike who said, that it's the environment that disables, you know, and I think how much as a, of a, as a council, how much of the environment is our responsibility, the public realm is our responsibility, and, uh, and I think I'll be looking at that in a completely different way as a consequence of that comment, so thank you, Mike. And, and I guess as a person, um, the thing that sort of rang true for me was about the idea that, um, that it's all about attitude. Um, so I'll be also adjusting my attitude <laughs> with a focus on capacity. I think that was also a great take home message. So um, ladies and gentlemen, if you can just um, join me in thanking them as I deliver these gifts. The f our first gift is uh, to Sue. Um, Sue, who's the person who wrote tonight's um, hypothetical, and I think really uncovered some of the, um, some of the issues for us. So to Sue, Sue Gilby, if you can give her of our um, panellists, Nick, thank you very much, and Happy, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and we've been told that uh, our hostess preferred wine, <laughs> <laughs> and so we have a lot of <laughs> and so we have a bottle of wine for Claire O'Connor. Can you join me in thanking our panel? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings uh, tonight's festivities to an end. So please continue to enjoy some hospitality. Please eat some of that food that's sitting on the table. And thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.